Our speaker today is Dr. Lauren Bakalitz. She's a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Otolaryngology, as well as the director of the Center for Microbial Pathogenesis at the Research Institute at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. She's internationally recognized for her work on molecular mechanisms that underlying polymicrobial infections of the respiratory tract, including otitis media or middle ear infections, sinusitis, and exacerbations of both chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and cystic fibrosis. Her focus is on three predominant pathogens, non-typable haemophilus influenza, Morixella cateralis, and streptococcus pneumoniae. Uh, Dr. Bakulitz is also the Vice President of Basic Sciences and holds the Tilly E. Coleman Endowed Chair in Pediatric Research. She was na um, named an Ohio State University College of Medicine Distinguished Professor in 2013, and that's a lifetime distinction. Her laboratory's longstanding interest has been in the design and testing of vaccine candidates for the prevention and resolution of otitis media and exacerbations of COPD, including the development of a method to effectively immunize non-invasively by putting basically a Band-Aid on the skin behind the ear that contains the vaccine, allowing transcutaneous delivery. Animal studies suggest efficacy, and she hopes to move in this direction after approval of her current vaccines. The laboratory also has a significant progress in the study of biofilms, communities of highly resistant bacteria that are recognized, uh, that are responsible for a majority of infections, um, both recurrent and human and animal infections. She serves as a chair of an NIH study section on host interactions with bacterial pathogens. She has greater than 150 publications in this field and holds quite a few patents for her research. In 2016, she received an Excellence in Innovation Award from the Research Institute at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Her team has identified unique universal targets for biofilm disruption and disease resolution and are working to move these forward with clinical trials for an extensive preclinical testing and evaluation, which I'm sure she's going to tell us about. Her title is How to Bust Up a Bacterial Biofilm. Please join me in welcoming her. Well, thank you, Dr. Frank, for that kind introduction. I'm delighted and honored to be, um, to have been invited to give this lecture you today, and I'd like to thank all those people who took time out of their busy schedule to spend a moment with me today and tell me about their work. It really was a fascinating day, and I enjoyed it very much. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, technology we developed to disrupt bacterial biofilms that came about as really an unexpected observation as we were attempting to finish um, development of a vaccine candidate to prevent otitis media due to non-typable homophilus influenza. And no lecture of this kind can start without a brief uh, definition of what a, a biofilm is. For those of you who don't think about biofilms 24-7 as I do, uh, this is the preferred lifestyle of bacteria in nature, whether they're growing on a, um, a biotic surface or an abiotic surface. And basically, bacteria in the environment will sit down on a surface, they will attach and begin to produce an EPS or extra polymeric substance matrix. These bacteria are often polymicrobial in nature. They will differentiate with distinct functions or job functions within that, within that bacterial biofilm. Quorum sensing is part of their communication system, and at such times as they deem it ideal, they will disperse from this biofilm, go out, um, and reestablish re themselves on a different surface. In the environment, this is what we think of as, as what's happening in terms of biofilm biology, but when it involves the human host or an animal host, we think instead of the involvement of bacterial biofilms in disease and infection. And this really is the reason why we study biofilms. They're very common diseases, they're complex, and they're very difficult to treat. Whenever you put a device, a foreign device, in the human body, anywhere in the body, it is very prone for biofilm development on that device, and this can lead to very long-term and sometimes very insidious infections. But they're also associated with many common infections that many of us have or will at some point suffer from, including sinusitis, chronic urinary tract infections, wound infections, et cetera. 
So for today's talk, I'm going to focus on one of these diseases, and that's otitis media, or infection of the middle ear. This is an area that I've studied my entire career, and it's going to serve, I hope today, as a model for you of what we're trying to attempt that we believe actually has utility for more than just otitis media, but biofilm infections and device infections as a whole. So just to give you a little bit of background on otitis media, the bacteria that cause otitis media are commensal. They reside in the nasopharynx, so the nasopharyngeal opening to the orifice. And usually with concurrent or preceding viral infection, these bacteria will ascend the eustachian tube in a retrograde fashion, gain access to the middle ear space, where they will then fill that space with fluids, pus, blood, and ultimately biofilm. And this can impede hearing. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's a very, very common disease in the pediatric population. The global burden of acute otitis media is still tremendous. We estimate there are about 709 million new cases of acute otitis media per year. Not many deaths, fortunately, about 21,000 are reported, and it's usually due to meningitis. But the most severe form of otitis media, chronic suppurative otitis media, or CSOM, is estimated to affect upwards to 330 million children, with about 50,000 deaths per year in children under five years of age. Common complications of otitis media, of course, are hearing loss, it's sensoroneural hearing, or it's um, uh, transduction hearing loss. It causes developmental delays in behavior, language, and education. There's tremendous pain associated with otitis media, at least uh, acute otitis media. But the biggest concern many of us microbiologists have is this prolonged antibiotic treatment in childhood, often with broad spectrum antibiotics that has induced a sobering emergence of multiple antibiotic resistant bacteria in all three of the predominant genera that cause otitis media, but also in other microorganisms that reside within that nasopharyngeal compartment. Now, these are the three predominant causative agents of otitis media, uh, the two gram negatives, non-typable haemophilus influenza, and Marxella cateralis, as well as the gram positive streptococcus pneumoniae. And I'm going to focus my talk today on non-typable haemophilus influenza, which I'll refer to as NTHI, for the remainder of my talk. So very common sequela of otitis media is otorrhea. And this is very common in children who've had tubes placed to relieve the pressure and pain that they experience due to otitis media. This tympanostomy tube is placed in the tympanic membrane, and it serves to drain the fluid and relieve the pressure and pain in that ear. This is very, very common. Upwards of 700,000 children have term tubes placed each year. But upwards of anywhere between 10 and 70 for 74% of those children will experience something known as post-tympanostomy tube otorrhea. You can see the tube here, and you can see this drainage of fluid and pus coming through that tube. And this is due to the long-term residence of a biofilm in that middle air space behind that tympanic membrane. Now, in, in, in countries where tube placement is common, we have post-tympanostomy tube otorrhea, but in countries where <clears throat> tube placement is not common, those tympanic membranes often burst and puncture from the pressure of that infection in the middle ear space. And in these children, that pus and fluid just simply drains out through that hole in their eardrum and down the side of their face. And this can be quite common in children up to four years of age in the developing world. So this condition, CSOM, is believed responsible for up to 50% of hearing loss worldwide. 60% of those children with CSOM have a significant hearing loss, and 90% of the burden of that disease is borne by the developing world. There is currently no consensus on the ideal treatment of either post tympanostomy tube otorrhea or CSOM. Both otitis media and otorrhea are biofilm diseases, though, and so those biofilms present in the middle ear are responsible for the chronic and recurrent nature of these diseases. We use a chinchilla to model otitis media. This is the gold standard animal model for otitis media modeling in most of the laboratories in the United States. And here is a healthy chinchilla middle ear projected here on the left. Here's the eardrum or tympanic membrane. 
Middle ear is lined by a single cell, squamous cell layer of epithelium. It is an air and humidified um, atmosphere filled space. And you'll see later in my talk that I'm going to be referring to these normal bony septae or processes in the middle ear as depth gauges we're going to use to estimate how much biofilm is present in the middle ears of this host during some of the studies that we're going to, um, to, to conduct. When a biofilm forms by homophilus in the middle ear space, you can see that this entire space is filled with this pulpy white material. The eardrum is inflamed, and this would be what equivalent to what a pediatrician sees when they look down the auditory canal towards the tympanic membrane. And this biofilm um, is very, very hardy and very recalcitrant to any kind of treatment. Now, if you take that biofilm and you snap freeze it over liquid nitrogen and impart a live dead bacterial stain to it, where the live bacteria are green and the dead bacteria are red, you can see the beautiful architecture of this biofilm extending from the middle ear mucosa, which is depicted here, and these long, thin, green, finger-like projections of thousands of live bacterial cells <clears throat> in these towering communities are extending into the lumen of the middle ear space. They are alive. You can see very little red color in these biofilms. And the problem with the biofilms is that whether they're in the middle ear space or anywhere in the body, they're highly resistant to killing by innate effectors of immunity. They're highly recalcitrant to treatment with antibiotics. And the estimates, the estimates that biofilm resident bacteria are resistant to doses of antibiotics up to a thousand fold greater than that required to kill their planktonic counterparts. And these do play a primary role in recurrence and chronicity of otitis media. So what my laboratory asked several years ago was, could we target any of the determinants that were expressed by these biofilm resident bacteria specifically to either prevent the formation of biofilms and or disrupt already existing biofilms? And to do that, we really had to look at the biofilm matrix and what the bacteria were doing when they resided in this biofilm. Now, a very common constituent of the biofilm EPS is extracellular, or eDNA. And this eDNA is both of host and bacterial origin. The EPS is often highly variable and contains many, many components. But very commonly, biofilms formed by human pathogens and animal pathogens contains DNA. We did not discover that. That was originally presented by Cynthia Whitchurch with Pseudomonas biofilms. But what we noticed when we looked at a biofilm formed in the middle ear of a chinchilla, um, and we were looking for the bacteria, which in the image I'm about to project are green, what we found instead, and intriguingly, was that the bacteria were here, and you can see them uh, reporting green. Uh, GFP was being driven by a reporter of a vaccine candidate we were monitoring. But you can see this tremendous lattice of cross-hatched DNA. So when this specimen was labeled with DAPI, we saw DNA in this thick specimen that had this tremendous three-dimensional configuration. Now, early on, we knew that the, the DNA on the outside of the biofilm was due to PMN netting, so it was of eukaryotic origin. But with in situ hybridization, very early on, we noted that on the outer edge of the biofilm, that DNA was of host origin, but on the inner aspects of the biofilm, the DNA was of bacterial origin. So we didn't really know what to do with that information. I had never worked with DNA that ever appeared in this cross-hatched fashion, but I had the um, benefit of giving a talk at the House Ear Institute, and in the audience was Steve Goodman from USC, who had studied this family of bacterial DNA binding proteins his entire career. And this family of proteins includes two members, IHF and HU. And what these proteins do, and they're depicted here, is we kind of think of maybe assuming a lobster shape, is that they bind to and bend DNA around that molecule. Now, they will bind to unbent DNA and, and bend it, but they prefer to bind to bent DNA, and then they will go ahead and bend that even further. What they prefer to bind to, however, are holiday junctions. And these are examples of bent DNA that are the preferred binding sites of both HU and IHF. And what these reminded us of was the image that we saw in the bacterial biofilm that formed in the middle ear of a chinchilla. And so what we wondered was, were DNA B2 proteins present within biofilms that formed by Haemophilus influenza in the chinchilla middle ear? 
So what Steve Goodman did was he gave me antibody to IHF from E. coli and asked me to label the interna internal aspects of that biofilm that had formed in the middle of the chinchilla. And this is what we saw. So you can see, I hope, that the DNA is in again, once again, this beautiful lattice formation. This is pure bacterial DNA. And at every cross strand of DNA, we had labeling with this antibody to the rabbit, rabbit anti E. coli IHF protein. Now, the positioning of this labeling suggested to us that the DNA B2 proteins were perhaps serving as a linchpin protein to stabilize that matrix, almost like the struts and beams of a building. <clears throat> and that we wondered if this was something that was just unique to the biofilm formed by non typable homophilus in the middle ear of a chinchilla, or if in fact, this was something that could be seen in clinical samples from human beings. So I have here just an example of several of these clinical samples that we've evaluated over the last 10 years. And you can see in an odorrhea sample from a pediatric patient, this tremendous lattice of DNA and the labeling with the DNA B2 proteins, which is projecting in red. This is a sinusitis sample from an adult with enterobacter, or E. coli enterobacter uh, fecalis in the sinus cavity. This is a cesarean section surgical site wound infection from a woman undergoing a, surgic, um, a cesarean section for delivery of her baby. And here's a sputum sample from a child with cystic fibrosis from which we cultured Burkholderia sinocipatia. And hopefully you can appreciate that in each of these four clinical samples depicted here, we also found this lattice of extracellular DNA of bacterial origin and a proliferation of these, a prolific amount of these DNA B2 proteins. So we had a hypothesis at that time that if we could remove these DNA B2 proteins from that eDNA lattice, perhaps we could collapse that biofilm structurally and release the resident bacteria. So to do this, we started with an in vitro biofilm disruption assay that was just done in a standard chambered cover glass. And what we saw was that if we let Haemophilus build a biofilm for about 24 hours in this chambered cover glass, and after the biofilm was built, we incubated it with naive rabbit serum. We saw that this biofilm was quite robust. It had very characteristic architecture. And you can see in this orthogonal section the relative height of that biofilm. When this biofilm was allowed to form for 24 hours and then incubated with a random dilution of anti-E. coli or anti-E. coli IHF, you can see that this biofilm was significantly disrupted both from the aerial view as well as this orthogonal section or view of this biofilm. And this was a significant reduction that was about 86% reduction in thickness and 87% reduction in biomass. So our hypothesis that by pulling these proteins out of the biofilm might collapse that lattice seemed to be bearing true, at least in vitro. But the question that we had at that time from everybody was, was this technology going to disrupt biofilms formed by other bacteria in vitro, at least as a starting place? So originally, we looked at a number of pathogens that we had experience with, and those are listed here at the top. But over the last 10 years, we've looked at all of the bacteria projected on this screen, as well as several mixed specimen, mixed clinical specimens, so mixed CF sputum, mixed species otorrhea, exudate, and a mixed species cesarean section wound infection. And even now, we've looked at all six of the escape pathogens and found that, at least in vitro, if we incubate those biofilms with the antibodies directed at the DNA B2 proteins, we do see disruption, significant disruption of the biofilm with release of the resident bacteria. So over the years, we've looked at the mechanism by which this is happening. So if you look at this cartoon of the biofilm where the bacteria are these green, um, these green uh, rods, and you can see the DNA is this white lattice, and the DNA B2 proteins are projected as these yellow circles. Typically, when you add antibiotics to a biofilm, you get very little killing of the bacteria within that biofilm. <clears throat> However, if we add antibody to the DNA B2 proteins, they will um, bind to any of the free DNA B2 proteins that are present in the environment. This will cause an equilibrium shift in the um, biofilm with release of additional DNA B2 proteins. 
um, and then catastrophic collapse of that biofilm and collapse of that eDNA lattice structure. And now, if you add antibiotics, you can have precipitous killing of those newly released bacteria. We know through a series of experiments that this is fast and specific. It's dose dependent. Direct contact is not needed between the antibodies and that biofilm to mediate this collapse. And most interesting to us is that those newly released bacteria are anywhere between four and eightfold more sensitive to the killing action of antibiotics than their planktonic counterparts. Not their biofilm resident counterparts, but they're more sensitive than even their planktonic counterparts which we believe is going to possibly give us an opportunity to treat some recalcitrant and recurrent infections by collapsing the biofilm and also synergistically adding antibiotics to the mix, but at a lower dose. So early on, we were trying to unravel the mechanism by which Haemophilus and per perhaps other bacteria put its DNA and the DNA B2 proteins into the biofilm matrix, or EPS. Now, bacteria can do this through lysis. They can simply lyse and re release their contents. They can have a programmed um, mechanism to release DNA to the environment. <clears throat> Excuse me, or Cynthia Whitchurch has shown with Pseudomonas aeruginosa and also non-typable Haemophilus that these bacteria can sometimes form these giant round cells. In the case of Pseudomonas, those giant round cells will burst and release their contents, but this did not happen with non-typable Haemophilus influenza, nor did it have a known, um, a, a known genetic pathway for release of DNA. But what we did notice was that when we put Haemophilus onto a glass slide very quickly, um, if we put log phase bacteria onto a glass slide, Within three hours, there was this lattice of DNA on the surface of that glass slide. By viability stain, we could tell that these bacteria were not dead. And in fact, when we labeled them with antibody to the DNA B2 proteins, we saw that these proteins were again positioned at the cross strands of this DNA lattice, which suggested to us that there was a, a more of a programmed method of release that was being mediated by Haemophilus, but that had not been characterized to date. So what we did to try to capture that is we stained the outer membranes of these bacteria with FM143 to label them green. We put the bacteria onto a culture dish to allow them to adhere and release their DNA if they were so inclined. We then added Ethidium homodimer to the medium, and Ethidium homodimer will uh, fluoresce red when it's in contact with DNA. And then we monitored by real-time microscopy over time. And what we thought we'd see at the end of that is that we would see these green outlined bacteria, and if they happened to have released DNA, we would see this flare or flash of red due to the Athenium homodimer. So what we saw with Haemophilus influenza, just wild type, log phase growth put on a slide for two hours is depicted here. And hope, hopefully you can see these flashes of red that we see, and you can also see the biofilm matrix forming around some of those cells. Now, if you get a close-up image of one of those cells, you can see that the bacterium no longer looks alive, but you can see this big flare of DNA coming out of one site along the long axis of that bacterial cell. Now, this happens to about 8 to 12 percent of those bacteria only, regardless of what we do. And the only thing we knew happened at one site along, long, along, along one long axis of Haemophilus was release of the type 4 twitching pillus. Now, we had studied and actually characterized the type 4 pillus expression in Haemophilus, and we knew that this is exactly what seemed to be the same site that perhaps this DNA and the DNA B2 proteins were exiting the cells, but this had never been described before. And our working model of the type 4 pillus machinery in non-type of Haemophilus was quite simple. There were only about 20 gene products, not 40, like in Pseudomonas. But in non-typable Haemophilus, the type 4 pillus exit through a pore formed by Kami. And Kami is the pill Q equivalent in Haemophilus. And we knew that this uh, Kami was expressed only in one site on the non-typable cell, as shown here by some recombineering where we had that expressing GFP. And we wondered, was it possible that Haemophilus was possibly also releasing DNA and DNA B2 proteins through this pore that it used to express its type 4 pillus? So we knocked out Kami, and we repeated the experiment. 
Again, we saw that about 8 to 12 percent of the bacteria had red associated with them, but this time the red was completely contained within the bacterial cell. It did not exit that cell. There was no flare of ethidium homodimer on the outside of that bacterial cell. It was all contained within the cell membrane, the outer membrane of the cell. When we complemented that mutation, we could restore that released phenotype to these cells. And this was exciting because it suggested to us that Haemophilus had figured out how to use its streamlined genome to get DNA and DNA-B2 proteins out into the environment through the Kami pore. But we had a problem because this is a gram-negative bacterium, and it also has an inner membrane. And they are not known to store DNA or DNA-B2 proteins in the periplasm. So how did Haemophilus get the DNA and the DNA-B2 proteins into the periplasm? Well, Haemophilus didn't really have anything in the genome that would suggest to us how it did that, but we looked to a sister organism, Neisseria gonorrhea, and the work of Han Hank Seifert at Northwestern. And he had characterized a type 4 secretion system, different from the type 4 pillus machinery, by which Neisseria gonorrhea could export DNA into the environment. When we looked at the genome of our Haemophilus workhorse, we saw that it did not have all the genes to express the proteins needed for the entire type 4 secretion system, but it did have remnants. It had TRA-C and TRA-G, two of the inner membrane proteins that are used by Neisseria to get DNA through the inner membrane. So we knocked them out in Haemophilus because we hypothesized that perhaps Haemophilus was using the TRA system to get DNA into the periplasm, and then the type 4 pillus system to get the DNA and the DNA-B2 proteins out into the environment. Now, when we took the TRA-CG mutant and put it in the same system with the thidium homodimer, what we saw instead was that the bacterial cells had the outer membrane still labeled in green from the FM143, but all the DNA was now contained within the cytoplasmic, me cytoplasmic membrane, and there was this dark region that represented the paraplasm suggesting to us, and again, if we complemented this back on a plasmid, we could get that release of DNA again. But really suggesting to us that what Haemophilus had done was figured out a way to use a combination of the TROS system remnants and the type 4 pillus machinery to get DNA and DNA-B2 proteins into the environment. We're currently working on trying to figure out what those cues are that trigger this process in that subpopulation. But in the meantime, we did have the opportunity to put these bacteria under an OMX super resolution microscope. And if you keep your eye on the bacterium here in the center, you can see that we were actually able to capture that release of DNA from this bacterial cell by that super res resolution microscopy. So this work continues, but I, I find it unlikely that Haemophilus is the only microorganism that might use a similar system to get DNA and DNA-B2 proteins into the environment, so we're continuing to pursue that. In the meantime, what was the, cr the clinical utility of these observations? And one of the first questions people asked us was, if you have a biofilm anywhere in your body that's causing a disease, and the DNA-B2 proteins are in that biofilm and playing such a critical role, why don't we make antibodies to those DNA-B2 proteins and resolve those biofilms and the diseases ourselves? And once we had this understanding, could we adapt that to develop either a novel therapeutic approach or a vaccination strategy? And what we hypothesized was perhaps when the DNA was bound to the DNA-B2 proteins in the biofilm matrix, as they are during the disease process, perhaps this was masking the immunoprotective epitopes or domains of those DNA-B2 proteins. So we used immune sera from um, an animal model, some synthetic peptides, and a biosensor to epitope map these proteins. And in order to do that, we used a chinchilla model, and we put Haemophilus influenza right into the middle ears of these animals on day zero. By day four, we know that there'll be a robust biofilm that develops in the middle ears of those animals. On this same day, and at the time, we were developing the Band-Aid immunization approach, um, and that's a whole different talk. We simply rubbed our vaccine formulation onto the skin of the chinchilla ear. We repeated that a week later, and then a week following that second immunization, 
we asked nine blinded reviewers to come into the room and rate for us how much biofilm was left in the middle ears of these animals. The cohorts we had were those immunized with adjuvant alone, and the adjuvant we used was double mutant of the heat labile enterotoxin of E. coli that John Clements developed at Tulane, IHF from E. coli plus the adjuvant, IHF that had been pre-complex to DNA to represent that that would be in a biofilm during disease, plus the same adjuvant, or as an additional control, DNA and the adjuvant alone. And if you look at this scoring system where this empty normal ear gets a zero because there's no biomass, and this ear would be a four plus, here's the gradations in between, you can see that DNA and adjuvant alone, these animals, their chinchillas are mixed sex, outbred animals, and this is a very typical spread you would see in that animal host. You can see that the mean amount of biofilm left after immunization with DNA and adjuvant was still close to three, to three, which means about 50 to 75 percent of the ear was still filled with biofilm. And this was not significantly different from those that were immunized with adjuvant alone or with IHF that had been pre-complex to DNA and adjuvant. Those animals that received the native protein that was not pre-complex to DNA were able to clear a good deal of that biofilm from their middle ears. Now, when we took the sera from these animals from this cohort depicted here in green and this depicted here in yellow, and we looked to see whether those sera could disrupt biofilms, what we saw was the animals that were immunized with IHF that had been pre-complex to DNA, which we had hypothesized would mask the immunoprotective domains, or the native form, which we thought would allow recognition of any immunoprotective domains. Those sera did not disrupt the biofilm if they had been pre-complex to DNA when they were immunized with this molecule, but it did disrupt the biofilm, and this is a random 1 to 50 dilution. If we use more antibody, we can get this down to a single cell layer of, of bacteria. So when you epitope mapped where that response was, what we could tell was that when the IHF was pre-complex to DNA is here, the predominant response was to this tail region, as depicted here in orange. Conversely, when we immunized with the native protein, the immune response was very much focused on these DNA binding tips, so the tips of this lobster-shaped protein. So depending on whether we were able to get a response to the tails versus the tips determined whether we did not or we did disrupt that biofilm. Now this gave us an opportunity, opportunity to really develop chimeric peptide immunogens that specifically targeted the regions we were interested in. So IHF and HU are dimers of proteins, and if you look at alpha subunit here in green and the, and the beta subunit here in orange, complex to DNA, we know that the tail portions of those subunits are not protective. They do not elicit antibody that will disrupt the biofilm, but the tip, the tip regions were. So what we did was we designed two chimers. Both of these are 40 formers. And the tip chimer peptide has the, a peptide from the alpha subunit tip, a small former linker peptide, and the, the 20 mer residue from the beta subunit tip of IHF. And that's depicted here on the three-dimensional molecule. And those antibodies, whether they're polyclonal or monoclonal, will disrupt biofilms. Conversely, and as a negative control, we also made a tail chimer peptide of the same length, using 20 mers from the alpha subunit tail or a 20 mer from the beta subunit tail, the same linker, and monoclonal antibodies to this did not disrupt a, a biofilm. So after we did um, some in vivo studies with those monoclonal antibodies and saw the effect that we expected, the question came up was whether the FC portion of those monoclonals was necessary for the biofilm eradication outcome that we saw. And if our model was true, that the um, antibodies were titrating the DNA B2 proteins away from the biofilm, we should not need the FC portion of those antibodies to see the same outcome. And if we used fab fragments, we would be able to show that you didn't even need the divalent binding properties of a traditional antibody to disrupt those biofilms by this equilibrium shift. So again, we used a chinchilla model. And this time, we went ahead and we built biofilms. We let the organism build biofilms for four days, as I told you before. This time, however, on days four and five, we put fab fragments directly into the middle ear. And these were fab fragments of either naive rabbit IgG 
fab fragments of tip chimer um, monoclo or polyclonal antibody or fab fragments from the tail chimer peptide immunogen. The day after we did the second treatment, we looked to see how much biofilm was resident, still remained in the middle ears of those animals, had blinded evaluators score that, and then we let a cohort go an additional week to make sure that any biofilm that was cleared in any of these cohorts did not grow back in that intervening week with no additional treatment. And what we saw in um, the chinchillas that were um, delivered naive antibody fragments, there was a very high bacterial load of Haemophilus in the middle ear, both one day after the second treatment that was a little reduced at day eight, but stayed fairly high. There was no effect of the, the tail chimer fabs. But in the animals that received the tip chimer fabs, we had a significant three log reduction in CFU of Haemophilus within the middle ears within one day of the second treatment. And that was reduced further a week later with no additional treatment. And in this case, four of six animals had no um, culturable Haemophilus in that middle ear space. Now, in terms of what the biofilms themselves looked at, look like in the middle ears of these animals, again, if a zero is an empty middle ear, when you can see these bony septae as depth gauges, and a four plus is an ear that's filled with biofilm. We saw that those animals that received the naive fab fragments, there was biofilm that actually increased over that week's time. There was no significant difference between those animals that received the tail chimer fab fragments and then those that received the naive fab fragments. But those that received the tip chimer fab fragments had a very significant reduction in biomass. And in fact, four of the uh, four of six years had completely eradicated biofilms a week later. So these biofilms reduced in size or the host was able to clear them. And again, I want to point out that we did not add antibiotics and we did not treat these animals with additional antibody during this period of time. So what did we see? Well, this is what the middle ear looks like in the animals that receive the naive IgG fragments. And hopefully you can see this mucosal biofilm present in that middle ear space. There's also mucosal biofilm that's pretty much masking these um, septae in the animals that receive the tail chimer fabs. But in the animal that received the tip chimer fabs, and this really is a representative image, I hope you can appreciate that there you can see through the mucosal layer in this middle ear and see the capillary bed that lies under that very thin mucosal layer. So this was a very, very um, positive result for us because this ear almost appeared to return to normal homeostatic conditions despite the presence of this gram-negative microorganism in that middle ear space just days earlier. A week later, the biofilms remained. In fact, they increased in those animals that received the naive IgG fragments, and you can see inflammation of the tympanic membrane. There was still biofilm present in the ears of the animals that had the tip chimer fabs. And once again, there was no growth, regrowth of the biofilm in the middle ears of those animals that had received the tip chimer fab fragments, suggesting that once that biofilm was disrupted by this equilibrium shift, this animal, this host, was able to clear the remaining release bacteria and the remaining biofilm remnants from that middle ear space. So you, if you recall back to my first chinchilla experiment where we immunize with either native DNAB2 protein or the DNAB2 protein that had been pre-complex to DNA, people started to ask us, well, why don't you just use the native protein? Why are you using this chimeric tip peptide immunogen if you had a good result with the native protein? And we were concerned about this for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, we used our animal model to see if there was a difference between use of the native protein as an immunogen or the tip chimer peptide. We looked at relative ability to disrupt pre-established biofilms in vitro over time to compare these to each other. But I really wanted to, I was really concerned about original antigenic sin because if our model was correct, and people with existing biofilms or a history of biofilm diseases had generated an immune response to those non-protective tails. There was a very much a concern in our minds that if you immunize with the native protein, you would continue to drive that non-protective response over the protective response to the tips, and that that could lead to a non-effective resolution of disease. So in the animal model, and again, this is similar to what I've told you throughout the remainder of this, this um, lecture, these animals received either naive rabbit IgG, 
rabbit anti-native protein, IgG, rabbit anti-tipchimer, IgG, or rabbit anti-tailchimer, IgG. They were, um, this IgG was delivered once again on days four and five after that biofilm had formed. They were assessed a day later, a day after the second treatment, as well as a week after that. And what we saw in the chinchillas was not unexpected. Once again, naive serum really had no effect on clearing mucosal biofilms. Rabbit anti, um, this rabbit anti tailchimer peptide was no different from those that received naive rabbit serum. And we had a good effect with both the rabbit anti native protein here in green, as well as the rabbit anti tipchimer peptide. And it looked to us like the anti tipchimer peptide was doing a little bit better job, but there was no significant difference between these two because this model is not sensitive enough to detect that difference. So we did a kinetic assay in vitro, and we found that if you let a biofilm form in vitro and you treat it with medium, the biofilm pretty much stays stable over 120 minutes. Same when you treat it with naive rabbit serum. No difference when you treat it with rabbit anti-tailchimer peptide. But when you treat that preformed biofilm with antibody to the native protein, you see disruption of this biofilm that's very rapid. It occurs within five minutes and continues on. And this was even greater um, when we treated with the rabbit anti-tipchimer peptide. Again, both of these were very effective, but in all cases, the antibody to the anti-tipchimer peptide induced the most rapid and greatest resolution of this biofilm over time. And this is a non-typable homophilus biofilm. But what about the human response to these proteins? So we used a biosensor assay and sera from both healthy adults and children with chronic otitis media and sinusitis to, to determine what do children walking around with ear infections or, or normal healthy adults walking around having a history of biofilm disease recognize when it comes to these domains of the DNAV2 proteins. And when we looked at um, archived pediatric sera, as well as fresh sera from children undergoing tube insertion for chronic otitis media. Except in the case of this one child, child 11, they all had a pre-existing response to the tail, the tail version of the DNAV2 proteins. Healthy adults sampled from our center. All 10 healthy adults already also had a pre-existing response to the tail portion of that protein, suggesting to us that our concern about um, the potential to keep driving that non-protective response in these individuals would be great if we immunize with native protein. We tried that in chinchillas just to test this. Here's a, a chinchilla and its natural response is greater to the tail than the tip. When we immunize with the native protein, we drove that response to the tail. We also increased the response to the tip, but this tail specific response predominated. Conversely, in another chinchilla, which again came into the study with a tail preferred response, when we immunized with the tipchimer peptide, we were able to redirect that immune response to the immunoprotective tip domains of the protein. So many, many, many studies forward that I, I have no time to discuss today. We've now um, humanized those monoclonal antibodies to the tipchimer peptide, and they're currently being assessed for potential future use in clinical trials. So in conclusion, eDNA and DNAB2 proteins, um, this lattice that they comprise has been universally seen in all of the biofilms we've tested to date. Um, this does not mean that they're in every biofilm, but every one we've tested to date, and I showed you a list of those earlier. Antibody against the immunoprotective domains did mediate biofilm collapse with release of the resident bacteria, not only in vitro, but we've now validated this in three animal models of disease to date. The increased susceptibility of um, these newly released bacteria to killing by traditional antibiotics we think might provide us with an opportunistic window to demonstrate synergy with existing antibiotics but used at a markedly reduced dose. The fab fragment efficacy confirmed that these anti-DNAB2 sera appeared to work by disrupting biofilms solely by induction of this equilibrium shift that does not require complement or divalent binding by those antibodies and the development of novel DNAB2 targeted strategies to, to disrupt pathogenic biofilms, as well as to remediate dysbiosis by promoting the development of healthy biofilms are underway in our group. 
So I want to thank all the people in my lab very recently, as well as a few just recently passed individuals and our research interns. Um, my colleague, Steve Goodman, who is the one who brought the DNA P2 protein expertise to this whole program in his laboratory. Um, I've been funded my entire career by NIDCD, and I'm extremely grateful they have funded all the work that I've shown you here today, and we're excited to move this forward, hoping that there's some clinical utility to these observations. So I want to thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Yeah, there's two situations I can think of where this would be. I mean, obviously, it's, it's useful all across the spectrum of diseases, but in particular, cystic fibrosis mm -hmm. in pediatric disease would be an obvious choice. If you've ever seen them at autopsy, it's just a sea blue infiltration. It's probably horrible in, in life. And also, in terms of the, the new uh, medical devices, defibrillators are very common nowadays. And as you know, one of the reasons to take them out is because you get an infection in biofilm. And in terms of, of, of left ventricular assist devices, that could be, mean the difference between life and death, because if, once they get infected, if you take it out, a patient has no other way of living. Have you investigated clinical trials, or are there clinical trials underway with respect to those conditions? Um, I can tell you that we are in active discussions right now about picking what indication we would like to go after for clinical trials, and cystic fibrosis population is one that is very much on the short list for all of the reasons that you said. Um, we often think about, can we have access to the site? What organisms are causing the biofilm? Will we be able to deliver this in a way that is effective? And certainly the CF population is one of those, those in, uh, groups of individuals we're thinking about. We have a large population at Nation wide children's um, that is under care of an excellent group. Also, the issue of environment and device biofilms are things that we're considering in a totally different category because we have found that this will disrupt biofilms whether they're on a biotic or an abiotic surface. So we truly believe that this can be synergized with other approaches for biofilms and, and sterilization of devices, but also has um, some legs in um, the animal care section, whether it's um, companion animals or um, livestock, where there are similar biofilm diseases to those that we experience in humans. So yes, all of those are being contemplated. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sir? Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, is the transportation of the DNA out of the bacteria energy dependent? Um, I, I can't answer that with data. I would imagine that it is, and we're trying to get at that now. It was a very unexpected observation um, in, 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 to us, and yet it's one that we can repeat easily. So we're now isolating the, that subpopulation and trying to determine a, a much greater deal about what the mechanisms of that export are and what the triggers are specifically for that subpopulation of cells. It's always 8 to 12 percent of cells, no matter what we do. So. There's a Thank lot you. yet to be learned. Thank you. Sure. So the question was the flash of DNA that I described. Um, I mentioned that we were working on that, and, and the question was whether I could describe how we're doing that. We can actually isolate that um, total red population of cells in the commie mutant, the one where we've blocked export, and we're hoping by pulling the RNA from that subpopulation of cells versus the parental isolates, we're going to be able to start doing some transcriptional profiling and figure out maybe what's different between those. Um, ideally, it would be nice to do that without cells that have been um, labeled with the thidium homodimer, but we have done a comparison of the RNA collected from those two populations of cell. The integrity is good, viability is good of both subpopulations, so it's a starting point, but that's how we're going to get at it. Is the um, DNA uh, binding to protein similar enough among all those bacteria that one antibody can bind all of it? It's similar enough because if you'll notice, the first antibody that we had was to anti-IHF um, isolated from E. coli, and we were astonished, to be quite honest. Um, there's only about 30 percent overall conservancy, conservancy across that enti the entire DNA B2 molecule, but there's a tremendous conserved C, C um, terminal domain for all of these proteins, and that antibody to E. coli IHF was the one that disrupted virtually every one of those um, biofilms. We've now also made antibody to other 
native proteins, IHF and HU, from other species. And except for one occasion where we know there's antigenic um, difference in one of the IHF proteins from a different organism, there's a tremendous amount of similarity, and, and the disruption has been universal. And so it appears so. Have you explored nanobodies at all? Have we explored what? Nanobodies. We haven't yet, but it's definitely something we hear all the time and very much want to do. Small molecules and nanobodies are absolutely in our, in our focus, yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to welcome, oh, one more question. I'd like to welcome all of you to the reception at the library <coughs> after this uh, final question. Any other questions? I'm sure she'd be willing to take them at the library reception. So what is the DNA actually composed of? Is, an, is it always the same DNA coming from each of the species? I wish I could tell you that um, because we've looked at that. The problem with DNA in a biofilm, it's a combination of DNA from some of these uh, dedicated release mechanisms, but it's also there from lysed cells. So after biofilm gets to a certain age, it's impossible to discriminate between what came from lysed cells where they're, they're dumping basically the entire genome or if there were particular hot spots of DNA that comprise this. Based on what we see and the quick, the rapidity with which this occurs, I'm guessing that it is total chromosomal DNA, but I don't know that for a fact. And people have been trying to figure out how to do those experiments for quite a few years, and I don't think anybody's got that figured out quite yet. If you know of any mechanism, let me know. I'm curious, too. Thank you.